Build compelling real-time apps quickly and scale them globally with the PubNub real-time network. Only PubNub delivers the core building blocks needed for any real-time application. Find out for yourself by signing up for free today. Visit PubNub.com. Welcome to This Week in Location-Based Marketing, the most trusted podcast dedicated to the new business of location. Is time for this week in location-based marketing. It is episode number 139. We're doing this live between Asifa and I on Sunday evening, July 21st, 2013. My name is Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv, located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, it's Asif Khan from the Location-Based Marketing Association, normally in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. But I'm actually in New York City in the Big Apple. Um, yeah, so um, here we are. Ho home of constrained bandwidth and no light, apparently, right? Yes. It's a dark, dark, you're in Gotham, the old uh, version of New York City. Exactly. Glad you could join us, Asif. And I would argue, in fact, that you are not normally in Toronto for the most part. Fair All enough. of basically May, June, and, and good portion of July, we recorded not from your uh, Toronto office. That, did we? that is true. That is true. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we got a big show today. Uh, we have uh, certainly we've got uh, big deals that happened in the past week. Certainly, some companies that uh, in, some Toronto companies that were involved, maybe a little acquisition from Apple. We're going to be talking about uh, talking about that, uh, and and a whole bunch of other companies. We got stories about Google. We got stories about Foursquare. We got a company. You know, I did a lot of work for early, early, early on the web days. A company called Intermap, and uh, you know, uh, certainly some good member news from DMTI Spatial and TomTom. Tom. We got our um, uh, a new mobile minute with Chuck Martin, and we're going to be talking about uh, augmented reality. And is it ready for prime time? Our uh, special guest is Keep founder Brian Wong, who is an incredibly young but incre incredibly gifted, talented entrepreneur raised a lot of money to uh, help with, uh, I don't know, invent rewards, uh, almost reinvent rewards in mobile. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty jam-packed show. I can't believe we've, we're going to fit it all into like the next six hours. So sit back, folks, and enjoy. Is that about right? Uh, th that's about sums it up for me. Yeah. So uh, before we get into it, anything that you need to talk about uh, for the Location-Based Marketing Association? Uh, no, we're, we're still uh, kind of in, in the summer uh, lull at the moment in terms of activity. I'm, I mean, I'm over here working on uh, the next part of the uh, Mobile Futures uh, program that we did in, uh, with uh, Mondelez Craft Foods. Um, so there'll be something to come from that down the road, but uh, you know, we're just having kind of internal discussions about that this week. Um, but the one thing I do want to mention is, is last week, in the middle of my vacation, I flew over to Washington, D.C., uh, on the hill uh, with a whole bunch of uh, crazy people that, uh, you, you know, it, it, it was, I was speaking at this conference and I'm sitting on this panel with like senior VPs from Boeing, Ball Aerospace, um, you, you know, uh, just crazy, crazy, NASA. Um, I, had, I had a guy, like a, 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 like a two-star colonel or something sitting beside me in full uniform, like on this panel. It was crazy, and um, you know, and, and I was the one guy in the room who you know could talk about what the average consumer uh, you know was doing with GPS uh, and how we're leveraging you know this and the apps that, that are being built and so on. Everybody else in the room comes from the space industry uh, and is talking about GPS in that context, and um, you know the next satellites that they're building, and it, it was just crazy stuff. And but. I, I can honestly say, and I've said this like probably a dozen times uh, since the event, like it was one of those events where I went into the room, I did my thing, and then I sat there for the rest of the day and just listened, and I learned an unbelievable amount of, uh, of information uh, that, I, that I consumed. And I don't normally come out of a conference saying, hey, I learned a ton today. Usually, you know, you pick up a tidbit or two, but like I, I spent 80% of my time just taking notes and writing and learning and just crazy stuff uh, about That's the next a good generation. Sign. Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot yet, you know, to come, and a lot going on in uh, in the future of uh, what, what they kept referring to as space-based assets. Assets. 
So space-based assets. Well, you know, I, I was I was saying a little bit earlier. One of the stories, our four stories, about Intermap, and and uh, early on uh, in their existence, I did a lot of work with those guys uh, in the mid early to mid 90s where we were doing an e-learning program on radar sat and and terrestrial mapping and all of these things and uh you know location is so different today from a you know the consumerization of location which is what we talk about yeah. quite often um and, and you know it's so different from that and from what nasa is doing and from what everybody else is doing and, and uh, you know the, the government and the armies are doing but uh, you know what we're seeing here and this is what we've been covering for now 139 episodes is that the consumerization of that the blending slowly you know especially with our third story around dmti the slowly blending of that of that enterprise grade location data with the commercialized version of that data to to create tremendous value in, in actual location whether that's um physical location whether that's terrestrial or global or or you know uh galaxy location and then also to you know map that to the lowly consumer which seems some somewhat insignificant when you're talking about space-based stuff and yeah and yeah but that's what we're in the middle of this. It's so funny, right? Polar opposites. That, and I think with the story about Intermap today, you're starting to see those things kind of merge. And um, and we've always talked about this along the way, that it's that data. You know, those companies have been doing this for 30 or 40 or 50 years that are, are we've been waiting for them to emerge and we've started to see that. And and that's that's pretty yeah. cool. You're the only guy that could talk about the consumers. There you go. And, and our first story is all about well, data. Uh, so, yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's jump in this first. Let's talk about the app of, of the week. This is a uh, I mean, I downloaded this. This is a pretty cool application called uh, Quad Streaker. Uh, Seif, why don't you why don't you talk a little bit about this? And I'll, I'll try to show a little bit about it as you go through uh, go through the, the 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 description. Quad Streaker. Yeah. So Quad Streaker. Uh, I mean, it kind of uh, you know takes some lessons learned, I think, from Foursquare uh, in terms of uh, you know getting people to to kind of get out there and 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 visit new locations and places and discover things around them. But the idea is 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 really like a you know color your world kind of kind of app where, where the you know here here's a map of you know Canada or here's a map of the U.S. or you know a, a specific uh, geography. And as you go and visit these places, it colors in that square to say, hey, you know, th this is a place you've been and you, you've completed that square, so to speak. And, you know, there's other squares yet to be done. So go out and do that. So it's like keeping this history, this log of the places that you've gone to and, and, and you know, coloring them in. So as the name implies, quad, um, you know, square. Um, so it's kind of like four square, but quad streaker instead. Yes. Much cooler than four square. It is, and yeah, definitely much cooler. And I, I like this. I mean, I'm a forgetful guy, and I've, I've mentioned this many times. Is that uh, you know, I, I use apps like Moves and these things to remember where I've been. And and uh, so Quad Streaker is a it's it's a unique thing, and I can see the gamification happening here, right? Uh, certainly, the opportunity to to own quads or own squares and and compete with your friends. And and if there's anybody in Canada that that I know that you you know, please let's let's friend up and let's give this a try. Let's give this a true try, true, a true try. Um, you can you can find out a little bit more information uh, and a video at quadstreaker.com exactly as it sounds quadstreaker.com um, and you can also uh, there's a great video you can download this it is only available in the app store only on iOS unfortunately um, but you can go and download it if you happen to be the, one of the 300 million people that are running iOS which is small market yeah quadstreaker.com all right, before we jump into the news items, uh, I do want to play a mobile minute here. This is a new series on untether.tv. This is with Chuck Martin, the, the author, multiple author. He's written two books on mobile, uh, and uh, we are doing this daily. It is ambitious. We are into week number four. I love this. There are 15 episodes. We've got five more that will be up this week. This is, uh, one, this is Mobile Minute number 126, and it is on augmented reality. The title of this is Augmented Reality, ready for prime time. So here is the Mobile Minute with myself and Chuck Martin. It's that time again for a Mobile Minute. Chuck, um, Tomi Honan, who is a sooth sayer on the other side of the planet calls augmented reality the ninth mass media is it ready to move big time 
Uh, well, if you look at what's happening with AR, augmented reality, which is a terrible, terrible name, but that's what it's called. Uh, it basically is, is is living in two spaces. One is the of the the printed on the printed page. So where Ink Magazine, for example, is is used it with a company called Layer. Out of uh, they were one of the pioneers, uh, early pioneers out of Amsterdam. Uh, and they're actually doing a lot of stuff inside magazines with that. The other kind of augmented reality usage is in in space, basically not not outer space, but really just just space. And Valpak recently just launched this with their coupons. And what they did is the the key thing is that you can actually see the coupons in space. Now this is a, a screenshot of you basically aim you take your phone, you aim at 360 degrees, and it will show you on the phone where the coupons are. Next stage of this, of course, is going to be in aisle linking with products, and that's pretty mainstream. So out of the two that you've seen there, the print version as well as the one that's in space, what do you think is the most logical one that will catch on with consumers? Uh, the easiest one to use is print. It's the most effective, although this coupon thing is pretty neat but I'm looking at space. So I, I don't know. We'll have to see. And that was the Mobile Minute. Love your thoughts on whether or not you believe that augmented reality is ready uh, for prime time. Please reach out, Robert on tether.tv or asif at the lbma.com. Let us know your thoughts. And if you'd like to actually leave us a voicemail or a comment of any kind through voice, just go to untether.tv forward slash talk and you can have your say. We'll play it right here. If you have a question as well, do it there. All right, on to the stories. This past week was a very busy week. Our first story talks about a company, a good Toronto company that we've mentioned many times on This Week in Location-Based Marketing, uh, getting scooped up by this tiny company called Apple, who seems to be taking maps seriously now, Asif. Yeah, really excited about this one. Uh, uh, one of our uh, LBMA members uh, here in Toronto, a company called Locationary, um, uh, and uh, picked up by Apple, uh, Really, as you, as you implied, to kind of improve the accuracy of the data uh, that their maps uh, are based on, and Locationary's kind of secret sauce, uh, and we've talked about them before, is really about sort of uh, a gamification model around uh, you know the accuracy and the quality of the data itself. Uh, so it's not just you know user generated business listings or you know, even even businesses putting in their own business listing and trying to maintain it, there's this third layer of, uh, in addition to those two, uh, of, um, you know, consumers playing a role where they can go in and verify the accuracy of that data, uh, check it, and, it, it and, and if they check it and they find that, you know, the listing is incorrect in some way and they correct it, they get, you know, compensated for that in a micropayments type of uh, transaction. And then, you know, this kind of continues on. So, um, you know, so obviously the data is really good. The quality of the data is is, is excellent uh, and accurate. And Apple needs you know better accuracy and data around their maps. So th this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you think? Well, I, I mean, it goes back to that whole idea about uh, data normalization, location normalization, yeah. right? Which was, uh, you know, when you can add a rewards layer to uh, to a location and make sure that it is actually the location that it is supposed to be in the same in the spot that it is supposed to be instead of sending you know google trucks around and indexing the entire globe by driving the planet uh, you know I, I think that this is a this is a perfect match but uh, and it's great that it's a canadian company i love the fact that it's a canadian company um, again, though, like, uh, you know, was Locationary, do you think that they had the ability, you, you're an advisor, they're, they're an LBMA member, did they have the potential to, to really become a large, flourishing Canadian company, or were they always destined to be, be acquired by somebody for something, especially with the Waze acquisition by Google? Um, you know, personally, I think they were always on that acquisition path. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the mm. interesting thing about their, their, their platform, their system, uh, and I still believe there's there's opportunity here. Is there's still a need for some global standard uh, in this space for for place data, and whether it was locationary system or somebody else's, that has to happen. Um, and now it won't be theirs, obviously, because you know Apple's Apple, and you know they keep everything to themselves, as all these other companies do. So, um, yeah. but uh, for me, I you know I always saw saw them kind of on that path, uh, you know, the, the, the two guys that are kind of at, at the head of Locationary, Grant Ritchie and Dan Servos, I mean, these are guys who've been there before. Dan sold a company previously to Google. So, I mean, these guys understand that uh, that game, so. Well, uh, you know, it's always interesting. Like, I'm, 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 I always stand on two fences here, on the two sides of the fence, is that, you know, I love the fact that people take the opportunity to exit. Whatever the value is, it's enough to make sure that these yeah. two guys are interested in leaving. Or, or at least 
moving their business and probably flourishing inside of Apple and really creating something of great yeah, value. I, I, I mean, that's so. the promise of what Apple brings. Uh, but the flip side of it is, as a Canadian, I hate this hollowing out bullshit that happens with small companies that get picked up for for at a, at a lower valuation that they could be maybe two or three or four years down the road. So, uh, you know, that's that's. Um, but you know what? Somebody offered me, uh, you know, ten bucks and uh, I don't know a case a case of beer and a pack of smokes for Untethered.tv. I'd probably sell. You know, so I'm 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 not I, you know I don't have a high lofty expectations. <laughs> I just yeah. you know, I just like to get drunk and you smoke. Just want the golden handcuffs though. Exactly. That's it. I just want I want to be an indentured slave yeah. for two years. Yeah, there you go. So. At the same time that Apple bought this, like almost immediately after that, uh, they announced that they bought this company called Hopstop as well. For this is real time uh, public transportation data information, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. A another great company. This company happens to be based in New York, uh, and Joe Mayer, uh, who's the uh, CEO, met this guy a couple times. Uh, also, really, really sharp guy. Uh, you know, uh, guy. You know, typical New Yorker, right? He's you know just gun ho about his business he's gonna get it done he got it done uh and here it is uh you know apple picking up this company and the one of the pieces apple was missing in the maps platform you know besides the accuracy of the data itself around around places is they didn't have the transit uh option like google has when you go to you know create a uh a search on google maps you can you can choose to have you know walking directions transit directions you know so on Apple did not or does not have the transit piece, which Hopstop now can uh, enable them to provide. So, so good acquisition, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is, and I don't think any numbers. I mean, you know, uh, Apple never announces the value of this. They didn't. They didn't announce the value of the Siri deal. They didn't announce the value of the location air deal, and they didn't announce the Hopstop deal. And they say, listen, you know what? We are in the habit of buying small companies. We don't announce those deals, and uh, and I, you know. I'm going to assume that we're going to see locationary embedded in the next version of iOS and the Maps version with version seven. Uh, I'm going to assume the same thing with Hopstop as well. These guys will yeah. bring be brought right in very quickly. That's my guess. Yeah. Uh, so big day for Apple. Big day for locationary. Big day for Hopstop. Congratulations, guys. Now go do some good with those uh, with uh, Apple Maps, please. Please get me where I'm going. And then now the next thing for Apple to do is buy a company that allows you to do offline mapping uh, with their, their, their with the software. Because again, I was I used it again. It's terrible if you don't have any offline uh, maps. Uh, it yeah. just doesn't work. All right, our second story. Remember back in the day, uh, you know this guy Dennis Crowley uh, was working on a project. What was that project called? Foursquare. Yeah, before that, oh, it was like the. Dodgeball, they bought Dodgeball, brought it into Google, yeah. Google turned it into Latitude. Uh, then uh, they weren't happy with that. They spun out at Foursquare, Latitude existed. Now it turns out that Google is killing Latitude, putting you know that final stake in Crowley's vision of Dodgeball. Um, is this, so Google is killing Latitude. Is this a good thing, a uh, bad thing? You know, do people use Latitude? That's the question, right? I, I mean, I don't know anybody who really uses Latitude. Um, you know, they had a, a decent user base in comparison to Foursquare's user base, uh, from, from you know from that point of view. Um, but they basically released a new version of Maps, Google Maps, you know, earlier this week or last week, I think yeah. it was. Uh, yeah. And all of a sudden, Latitude was gone, and and the replacement, so to speak, is is they want you to share your location or check in, you know, in Google Plus. Makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense, right? So, in, on the one hand, it makes sense that they're kind of pushing the traffic to Google Plus. That's their kind of bread and butter at the moment, um, and dropping Latitude. Uh, sure, there'll be some people, I guess, who are disappointed in Latitude. I'm not one of them. I never used it to begin with, but um, hey, <laughs> I don't. I don't even know what to say about it other than. You know what? Google is obviously putting a lot of uh, weight and a lot of push behind Google Plus. It makes sense. I mean, you don't you don't check in, you don't do location in Facebook in another application. You do it through yeah. uh, through Facebook. It is a really really great way to turn that location into revenue in part of the stream with many 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 people using it, many millions of people using it. So you can't fault them. I think the biggest challenge that they've done is that they've they've only given people 30 days and they've killed the APIs yeah. right away. Like developer access to this is no longer as of, uh, you know, mid August. 
And I think that that's the the thing that this is the new reality of Google, um, which is, you know, trim, 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 and focus on the things that are going to make some money. And they had some disappointing uh, uh, revenue returns or results this past week as well. And I think that that you're starting to see this is that, you know what, the pressure is on Google to be able to actually generate some income from the data that they're collecting in the projects that they're working on. So focus on the things like they got rid of Reader. Got rid of latitude, yeah. latitude, and now in the developer edition don't, as well. Don't worry, latitude. don't worry. I mean, there's still an asset there. Marissa Mayer can still walk in and buy it. She's <laughs> yeah. buying everything. I know. It's crazy. How many times do we have to say we're for sale, <laughs> Marissa? And she's ex Google. Well, buy so us. There you go. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they have a phone number that you call and say like, "Hey, uh, yeah, I'm for sale." Yeah. If they, they just have, they must be getting so many calls, inundated with calls. Although they had, they had some good numbers. Uh, I saw I saw their numbers come out. So Marissa's doing her job. Better better than uh, better than expected, I yeah. think. Is uh, yeah. So for so, those of us who don't know who we're talking about, Marissa Mir, the uh, CEO of Yahoo. Uh, I think so. I think we have an educated audience, Asif. Well, I think that they they know exactly who that is yes. Well, so uh, Google kills Latitude, but actually they're just moving the actual check-in component, the location component, into Google Plus, and they're killing the developer API and developer access. Um, and I got a comment about that later on when we when we hit Foursquare in a little while. Okay. All right, our third story. Why don't you talk about this? This is uh, DMTI. A uh, this is a, a location based marketing association a member and uh, partnering with TomTom. In fact, TomTom selected DMTI, didn't they? Yeah. To do their data. Um, and and I'll get in trouble because we have we have our, our Amsterdam chapter where TomTom is based. I say TomTom like you, but I, it's I have TomTom. To, it's TomTom. Um, tom, tom. Tom, tom. So you, you have to say it properly, otherwise you tom, get in tom. trouble. Uh, anyhow, so it's DMTI um, and uh, partnering up with TomTom. Tom. And uh, tom, basically tom. Oh, what, what this is, is a pretty simple story, but a very, a very effective one. And when it comes to uh, address and business listing data in Canada, uh, specifically, um, you know, DMTI spatial is, is probably, you know, at the top of the heap in terms of, you know, the uh, longevity in the business, uh, accuracy of the data, and just quality, period. Uh, you know, we talk about locationary stuff, um, you know, from a global perspective in terms of sourcing stuff, you know, it, it, it's a pretty good database. But in terms of, of you know, uh, enterprise level uh, business data, uh, it's hard to beat what DMTI spatial has. So TomTom Tom basically um, has, uh, you know, is trying to improve the, their, their maps uh, in Canada, trying to improve their data, and they basically signed this this partnership deal with DMTI to say, hey, you know, now when you're using TomTom Tom, uh, devices, it's really, and you're in Canada, we're drawing on DMTI's uh, experience and, and 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 data sets there to kind of make it the best experience possible. And the reality is, is there's still millions of people who have, you know. Good old TomTom Tom, uh, devices, uh, you know, handheld uh, devices in their vehicles. Um, so there. Yeah, embedded in their vehicles or, uh, you know, I have one. Uh, you know, it's it's the one I give to my kids in the back, yeah. you know, in the back seat so that they know where we're going and they can also comment on how fast I'm going versus the sign. Yes. The actual exactly. speed limit, yes. I have one as well, yes. so yeah. 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 Well, I, I like this. And DMTI, it, it, those, those guys are always interesting to me because, uh, you know, la- location and, and place are only, uh, you know, are only a, a few components of the deep and rich data they have on each one of those locations and place. So it's not just about an address or a postal code or a street right. address. It is also about demographics around that area yeah, and in the building. Yeah. yeah. So the data that they're going to be able to pull out of this, hopefully, is going to be astounding. Like if you've ever driven through Detroit at night, and there are neighborhoods that uh, you should never go into at all, ever, even during the day. And wouldn't it be great if you could kind of put that, as you're driving through it, put that that crime uh, layer over top, right. top of it. And, and, and that it, that's what DMTI can uh, can provide to uh, TomTom. Tom. Wow. So, Detroit, yeah. Wow. Well, I was right. I went to a Bruce Springsteen show there once, and... Um, we were we were literally four blocks away from this. Uh, I think it was the Rosemont Theater. We were literally four blocks away from our hotel, and uh, and we said, okay, we're just gonna walk. And we told the bellhop, you know, at the hotel, we we're saying we're just gonna walk to the Rosemont. We just pointed us in the direction. He said, no, no, you're not. I said, well, come on, it's like two in the afternoon. And he said, no, you're not. You're not walking. Yeah. You're not walking. We're gonna get you a cab. They told us not to walk the four blocks. It was like eight minutes. It was like a two and a half minute cab, but. Detroit. Well, I, I mean, and it's only going to get worse. I mean, the you know, I, I was uh, you know just just leaving uh, for to head back from my vacation, 
And I, I, you know, I pull up the newspaper and I see Detroit, the city of Detroit's filed for bankruptcy. And I'm bankruptcy. Like, what? Yeah. Like this is just crazy, right? This. Wow. The population has got has halved in the last, I think, eight years or yeah. nine years. Seven hundred thousand uh, now. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's sad, 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 sad. And they got uh, they got a pretty decent baseball team. Yeah, and the hockey team's yeah. not bad either. No, that's right, Alfredson. Oh. <laughs> they're even All they're right. even in the right division now. So. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Well, they 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 breed a a a, a strong um, sports mentality there, but the rest of it is crumbling, and uh, and that's that's no good. But uh, all right, back to real business. So those are the first three stories: DMTI partnering with TomTom, or TomTom selecting DMTI for the Canadian data. I love that. I love it. It's about time. Um, we're going to take a break here because of our special guest. We're going to come back on the other side with th- three uh, great stories, uh, including uh, stories from Intermap, uh, stories from Foursquare, and a really cool uh, story on facial recognition uh, by Unical. 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 We'll get that name there right. You go. Before we get there, we got a uh, guest, special guest. It's an upcoming episode that will be up this week on, on Tether.tv. Brian Wong is the founder of a company called Keep. That's K-I-I-P at K-I-I-P dot me. Uh, he created a, he's created a company around reward. And uh, it's very interesting is that, you know, he doesn't believe in banner advertisements. He doesn't believe in, in interrupting an experience inside of a game or an application, a uh, mobile application. He believes in uh, serendipity and, uh, and surprise and delight, like we often talk about, but w- with rewards at, at specific times or, or, you know, random times, really. So when you finish a level is the perfect time uh, to pop up a reward or a, a, an incentive or something like that, an advertisement of some sort when you're most receptive to it. Now he's added, the company's added this contextual layer with location and awareness and, and uh, you know, your friends and putting it all together, your social graph, all putting all that together and, and, and pushing relevant ads at the re- most uh, opportune time. Um, and those ads are rewards. Ward ad. So I think that this is a, like, I've, I've wanted Brian on the show for so long. Finally got to spend some time with him. This episode will be up uh, on Thursday of this week. If you're looking at it a little bit later than this date, uh, then, then the, you know, third week in July, it is up there right now. Brian Wong is a smart, smart, smart guy. I know you'll enjoy this short clip of this much longer episode that will be up on untether.tv soon. So enjoy. Here is Brian Wong, the founder of Keep. Like, you know, there could have been moments in time when we just decided to, okay, all right, you know, we'll do video, we'll do points and incentives, we'll do all this BS. Because sometimes they do ask for it just because they want to test, they just want to see what you can do. But it's the, the, the trick and sort of the, 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 the thing you have to really uh, hone in on is, is not uh, succumbing to the things that you know are against your principles. And so I think keep, uh, keep we're, we're more proud of really the things we haven't done in many, in many ways, than, than the things that we did do, because we have we made sure we were very core to what the, the vision really was. Do you have any examples of those things? Is it? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, so I'm sure that the audience will have a chance to Google sort of get a basic understanding of what we do. But you know, when we first started, it was uh, you know real rewards for virtual achievements in games. That was the first line that we came up with, and that became the early part of the key pitch. And the idea was you would level up in a game, and in these moments of of delight and happiness, you know there would be an opportunity to be to be rewarded. And we wouldn't uh, tell you how to get the reward. That was a key thing. So it was, you know, hey, it's not like I say, hey, say, hey, Rob, hit level ten, and I'll give you this gift card. It was just do what you're doing already, and you know something natural will happen. It's like a surprise and delight. Now that was number one. That was the one that, that we constantly get challenged on. It still happens today, right? Where it's like, well, why don't you just make it so that you tell them, right? So that we can dangle the carrot. And I am so, uh, so stubborn on this point that it has become a signature of the company. That it is what makes keep is the serendipity of it. That we don't want to, to turn you into Pavlovian dog because you aren't. You're a human being. We want you to go about your day, do the things that you do naturally. And then have something there that's supposed to naturally augment that moment. So it's almost like moment making that moment better that you've already uh, engaged in. So that's that's the the one example I would say that a lot of well, we we could have gone many ways. We could have said, oh yeah, okay, fine. You download this app, you watch this video, you do all these things, then we'll give you it, right? And we have jump millions of these rewards in inventory. We could yeah. we could do tons of things to make you jump through, but we don't want it because that's just not who we are. And in fact, 
if I were to do that, I'm sure a lot of our company would leave today because that's not why they joined the company. They had, they had a lot of real reasons why they were excited about this, this model. So that's the first one. The second is video. So we've refused to make video a part of our model for a while now. And, and, I, and here's the thing. It's not because I'm not a fan of using video. <laughs> and people always have a huge thing. They go, Brian, like, you know, video is a staple in advertising, blah, blah. It's just that until someone figures out a way to make it so that it isn't the most interruptive thing on the planet when you see a video ad on your phone, then we're not going to partake. And we have some ideas. We've been working on a few. Um, but until I feel like if I use myself as a litmus test and I'm doing something in it and then I see the video and I go, oh, my God, I just want to vomit, then I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right? So that, that's the first requirement. And that's how I describe it to a lot of the advertisers who work with us. Like, listen, guys. You can use yourself as a, as a thermometer. It's very easy, right? You don't even need to survey people. If you don't like it, most likely a lot of people don't like it, right? Yeah. And you know who you are, especially when they make exceptions and convince themselves that, oh, because the client's paying all this money, I'm happy to destroy everybody's user experience, right? <laughs> isn't that um, funny though? Just, Brian, isn't that funny that, that people forget that they're users when they get into that selling, in that selling mode? It's like, you yeah. know, who, who consumes this? Well, the the user does. Well, are you a user? Yes. Yeah. Well, then would you consume that? No. Well, then yes. why do you do we're it? All, we're all users. Yeah, we're all it's human crazy. Beings. Yeah, we happen to be, I mean, you're a human being, right? I'm a human being, you know? Why yeah. don't we just use ourselves as, as, as a way to test this? <laughs> so that's the second. And uh, the third the third one is interesting, is, is points. Now, I think there's a lot of models that have been out there that use their own points and, and, and sort of help you sort of earn them and go to a catalog. My theory is quite simple. I'd rather use someone else's points. Right. That's that's really the, the way that we took this was I don't want to spend all this time building a currency and needing to manage it and showing people what the value is. Why don't we just use stuff that, that already has value? Like, you know, we work with Amex. Amex has their membership rewards. You've got United Miles. You've got all sorts of points that are out there. Air Miles up in Canada. That stuff already exists. Right. Why would I want to make a new one when there's already tons of people have to pay attention to? That's the first reason. Second was I didn't want to distract people, and it attracts a different type of audience. Now, I like to describe the Keep as the first sort of model of engagement that reaches normal human beings. Because when you think about an engagement, there's many ways. You, you, you do find the 5% of people that are super obsessed with collecting as many things as they can and compiling them and showing them off and being just, you know, into that whole thing. But not, not everybody does that. Right, and and that's if you ask a room of ten people, how many people actually do? It? I'd say, yeah, maybe two people will do it, but eight people will be like, you know what? I have a job, you know, I have a regular, I have, I have things to do every day. I don't just spend time thinking about how to compile points. So that's why we wanted to make it as, as widely applicable, and the way we would do that would would be to make the rewards instantaneous, and it was also to align with the fact that. You know, people today have this um, uh, schizophrenic complex where we, we we literally just like look at our phone and then you know put it away, and and you know it's just like there's only a few seconds there, right? You can't do something that 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 makes you wait. It's like oh, okay, all right, I gotta wait till the end of the month, then I'll know how many points I got or whatever, and then I'll go and buy something. Yeah, with the point. Uh, but it, I mean, all of those things seem logical in there. Uh, but it, you're going against the grain because if if you in a typical in a typical situation, if you took all those three away, people would ask you, say, mm -hmm. okay, well, then then what is it? What is it? Yeah, yeah. Right? exactly. That's the hard part, dude. It wasn't ever easy. You know, nothing that's going to make the world a better place is an easy thing to do. <laughs> if it was easy, then everybody else would do it. So what we decided to do was let's fight this. Let's make sure people realize that the whole point of this is not to advertise to or show something to or display something or get impressions or increase uplift and all this stuff. The whole point is to create a relationship with your potential customer, right? And you create a relationship through something that's genuinely uh, human. And, and the way it's human is by making it re reciprocal, by making it serendipitous. These are all very human things. We just compare it to, to how you interact with your friends and your loved ones. It's super simple. You don't just, you know, when you go into a conversation at dinner, go, Hey, would you like to work with me on this project? Hey, can you help me move? Hey, can you help me move? Hey, can you help me move? No, it isn't. It's, hey, let me just be a human being and talk to you, interact with you, spend time with you, reciprocates, you know, sort of surprise you. This is just how we interact with each other. Why can't brand the same? And the other thing I'll say is you have these very big CPG companies, right, that every one of them, I challenge you to look for their mission statement. Every single one of them has something in their mission statement about improving consumers' lives, right? This is what they do. Yeah. At least they convince themselves that that's what they do too, which is fine, which is fine. At least they're trying to. And the thing is their advertising doesn't do that. The advertising shits on your life, right? So I was like, if your products do this, 
or you want your products to do it, your extension of your product, which is your advertising, right? How you reach people, how you tell people what it is and what you're about to buy. That method should also help improve people's lives. And the other thing I will say that I got frustrated by the other day, I was talking to this app developer, and I won't name any names, but they know who they are, is, um, and they even admitted that they had a little bit of a problem, was that, you know, they were like, oh, I really want to make it so that people have to complete this ad or do this because otherwise we won't make any money. How do we pay the bills? And, and I'm like, so you're saying that you feel like you have to destroy the user experience in order to pay the bills. They're like, yeah, that's just the equation, right? I mean, this is how it works. <laughs> like, but you don't, have, you don't have to accept that fact, right? Like, let me, be the, let me be the shining light. Let me explain to you that there has to be that pro- the solution where everybody wins. And that's when we decided to introduce what we did um, but there are people that still feel that that's the case, and and that's not just a small percentage. There's a large percentage of people who go, yeah, okay, all right, you know, all right, I don't really want to put these ads in there, but all right, you know, I gotta pay the bills, you know, I got mouths to feed, and I'm like, that's not the equation you have to abide to. That's just that's not a law of physics. That is a a human made thing that we can absolutely change. That was Brian Wong. You can imagine an entire Untethered.tv episode with Brian dropping knowledge everywhere so go and check that out this coming thursday i appreciate brian for coming on to untether.tv i appreciate him allowing us to use this clip for this week in location-based marketing go to keep.me k-i-i-p dot me if you're a developer or a brand really 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 impressed with the with this guy with this company and where they're going small team big investment huge opportunity so uh brian thanks for doing this appreciate it all right to see why don't you take our fourth story intermap yeah, so uh, there's a company called Intermap Technologies. They uh, announced a, um, a platform called AdPro uh, 3.0 uh, for media buyers. Uh, it's a software as a service platform. And really, this is a platform about evaluating out-of-home media assets uh, from a location perspective. Uh, so billboards, digital billboards, you know, bus shelters, uh, urban furniture, whatever the case might be, you know, helping uh, evaluate, you know, is this the right, you know, location-based out-of-home asset for your campaign versus another one and, and you know, be, being able to kind of sort of benchmark one against the other. Um, all the software as a service, nothing to install, uh, all, you know, basically sign up on, online for an account and, and you can start, you know, kind of mapping and putting these things together. So it's all about campaign planning, uh, you know, and media buying and uh, evaluation of out-of-home assets. Amazing, like you know, I I always I always marvel at the way that uh, the companies can um, you know bring all, uh, literally bring all that data in together to be able to help people make a buy decision, and I know that that's what these guys are doing. Um, but I mean, back in the day, Intermap uh, was this GIS company, and I love how they they've made this transition, and um, certainly the U.S. version is uh, is getting a little bit more commercial. It just goes to say show what I was talking about early on in the show, which was. We are seeing this kind of this melding of, of industrial data with this commercialization piece to be able to make buy decisions like this. So very cool. If you're interested in Intermap, go to intermap.com. There you go. All right. So uh, Foursquare, I, I think we, we went last week without talking about Foursquare. This week, they have announced their new ad platform. We talked about this, that they, they, were, they announced it previously, but now they've rolled this out. These are supposed to be contextualized ads uh, being displayed in Foursquare. But what does that mean? Is this a, uh, you know, I think that they're being very cautious about how they're doing this, but this is their revenue play. Yeah, I mean, they have to have a revenue play. They're struggling uh, to, to, uh, to, you know, in, in, in our perspective, I think collectively to, uh, you know, keep this thing moving. And uh, they've raised a ton of money. They got to show some results. They need to, you know, start getting some real revenue in. Uh, it was just a matter of time before they had, you know, ads in this. Personally, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who use Foursquare or those who are still using Foursquare, um, you know, aren't, aren't going to care one way or the other whether there's an ad or the, there or not. Um, you know, so th- so they're talking about, you know, when you say contextual, they're talking about you're at a bar, you check in at a bar. And then you see a, a full page. These are full page, by the way, uh, ads that appear for you know Bacardi or Captain Morgan or or whatever the case might be, you know, with the intention obviously that you're at a bar and you're gonna order a Captain Morgan because you see an ad. I, I, you know, when I'm at a bar, you're I not? order what what I normally drink. You know, you're not gonna convince me to have a Captain Morgan just because I'm there. Uh, 
No, you know what? May, but maybe like uh, you know, I keep, I keep thinking that there's got to be something like um, uh, you know, there's got to be influence. Maybe a bar is not the right the right uh, thing. I know that Cap Morgan's was their one of their first partners to jump on board here, but maybe there's there there's got to be something where where you know that I've like I'm an Expos fan. I like Bruce Springsteen. I'm here. I do this, and it triggers something that means buy this or do, you know, I don't know what it is. But here's my problem with this, Azif, is that I Foursquare needs to make money. They need to make money. And they're going to convince partners like Cab Morgans to drop a whole bunch of cash and do this. And yep. effective or not, I, I don't know. This is part of their branding exercise. I would more uh, I would more appreciate something like uh, when I'm at a bar and I check in, a mad ad comes up with a pound taxi, right? So, yep. you know, uh, that kind of stuff as opposed to force, you know, pushing liquor on it. And I think there's a challenge here just, you know, around that. But here's the thing. I use Foursquare. See, if you use Foursquare, yeah. I don't launch the app, right? This is their biggest problem. I've said this many times about Foursquare. It's not the fact that they use it or they don't, or people use it yeah. or they don't, is that people use it. Why? Because when I check in with Instagram, I send my photos to Foursquare, right? I check in with Foursquare through Instagram, through Twitter, through everything else other than Foursquare. I have not launched that application. I don't even think I was just looking for it. I don't even think I have it installed on my device okay so who cares if they're putting up ads their number one challenge here is the exact same challenge that twitter had we've talked about this before is the fact that nobody uses that crappy app they use it through other means right they might use it start using it for discovery application but when it comes to checking in man i check in often but not through that application they do not own me yeah. what they have to do right away is close down their api C control the development community, funnel people into their application. You're going to piss a whole bunch of people off, but yep. it's what Twitter did. They have to do that if they want to own their business. If not, it's too late. I don't care if they, but it Rob, is. Eh? It's it's too late for that. It's too late for that. They're yeah. they're way too far gone around this. There's way too much money in this. The valuation is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this over and over again. Now they just yep. need to. Uh, all they can do right now is get some revenue in here. Start showing some some kind of revenues in here, and 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 you know, like we said from the beginning of the year, this thing is going to be sold this year. Get bought. Uh, it's going to get bought. Yeah. Uh, and and even, the revenue, even the revenue model around the around these ads is ridiculous, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, you know, it's uh, you know, most of these things are are you know are cost per click, yeah. right? This is cost per action. Yeah. Right. Like cost so. So action. in other words, Foursquare only gets paid. Only gets paid if somebody buys a drink, or yeah, <laughs> I don't know how. Um, well, I, you know, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, Foursquare, like you know, they they should have taken a, a page out of uh, Twitter's book. I know it pissed a bunch of people off, but Twitter is now going to start making a whole bunch of money because they they brought in the development community and they control the API and the data, and they brought that in so that they funnel it through their own application so they can turn revenue on that way. So, um, Foursquare, yeah, Foursquare with ads, I don't care. Go for it. I'm never going to see one. Yeah. Ah. Uh, All, right. All right. Foursquare. Foursquare. Do you think Yahoo would buy Foursquare? Is that are they back in this with Marissa Meyer's spending habits? No. Okay. Not it's even just, they would buy it. For that. Oh man. Youch. Zing. All right. Our last story here, Asif. This is uh, pretty cool. I have some. I have some thoughts on this. Uh, this is a company called Ubi Unicool. Unicool. I think I've got that right. I watched I the video so. like 17 times. Unicool, um, offering a service where you can pay with your face. And not in a way that like, you know, like a, like a, you know, the, the mob would do and pay with blood and, you know, punch you out. But, but this is pay with your face. So they scan your face and they scan your biometrics and you have a credit card attached to your face. And basically you pay by photo, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Helsinki <laughs> it's exactly based, that. Uh, this is a Helsinki based company. So a Finnish company, uh, Unicool, uh, I think you're saying it right. Um, yeah. So uh, they're describing this as military grade facial recognition algorithm. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, apparently it's robust. It's, uh, you know, the security is there, um, you know, and this kind of follows on the story we talked about last week with the, uh, you know, the biometric with the fingerprints and the, and the uh, finger veins and all that kind of stuff we were talking about in France. Uh, here, we, here we have kind of the, you know, the other side of that, which is facial recognition. And, 
you know, similar concept. It, it's you know, associating a credit card or you're associating a bank account with a with a photograph with a face, uh, a facial facial recognition element, uh, and then you walk up, the camera scan you, da da da, it matches the algorithms. You know, keep the security in check, and away you go, and you pay with your face. You pay with your face. <laughs> stamp, <laughs> stamp, stamp. Yeah. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I, on first blush, I mean, this technology is just awesome, right? So I think that, you know, uh, from what I read, and I read a couple of stories on this, is that as you're walking in line or you're standing in line, it's kind of scanning you. And so you gets up and it recognizes you. And then it, and it takes this, this payment process, which, you know, usually takes 30 seconds down to five seconds. And, and I think that this is a unique piece. I think it's really cool. But, but here in Canada, one of the challenges that I have is that it doesn't replace, uh, I mean, we have the pay pass, right? Yep. And Interact is about to do this. Our debit system is about to do this for you who are not listening to this candidate. So we have, we basically, uh, MasterCard is PayPass, right? Where you just tap it and go, tap it and go. And they're about to do this with the debit card as well, where you tap and go, tap and go. And it, and it, and it takes like, you know, three, four, five seconds to go through the transaction. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, while I'm impressed with this, it's still, still tied to the credit cards. Uh, it's still tied to your payment systems. There's, I think that there's much more opportunity for failure. Like, what if I grow a beard or something like that? Um, and do I have to get, then get a new photo taken? I, I, to me, this is this is cool but useless technology at this point. I, I think that there still is we're, we're we're searching for the way to pay with our bodies, um, and uh, we're all we're trying to do is is replace something that is so simple right now that everybody understands intuitively. Uh, where I can just I can tap my card. I'm not a luddite. I I believe in this kind of technology. I just don't think that the the payment process is uh, you know reducing it from 30 seconds to five seconds is where we we should be focusing on. It's much more about security. Removing the credit cards if you're going to do anything like that disruptive like that. Go right to my bank account. I, I you know so I think this is half a measure, but it's still very cool. Don't get me wrong. It's very cool. So uh, I half agree with you, and the other half of me says um, it, it's it's more than cool. The, 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 this is uh, this is about security. Uh, this is about uh, it is about speed, but but I don't think speed's the key issue here. I think yeah. that this is about security. So you know, with tap and go, the reality is is you know if somebody steals my credit card or my card, and anybody can tap and go with yep. it, right? Yep. There, there's no security on that. There's no not even a pin on, on that. No, no. Right? no. You know, so this is much more secure than that. Um, they have PIN as a second layer on this on this system, by the way. Um, but yeah. uh, in their in their testing, they're they're claiming ninety six point eight percent of the time users will not need a PIN. It's strictly face. Yeah. Um, you know, and and obviously, uh, you know, if a company wants to implement PIN, they can do that as well. So this is a security uh, feature. Biometrics, you know. I think there's the other aspect of this too. As we, as we, I don't want to talk about NFC too much, but if we think about NFC as contactless payment, yeah, uh, um, and we think about that from a phone perspective, where your phone is the mobile wallet piece, you know, the issue with that, as much as you know, we have hundreds of people trying to push for that right now in terms of vendors. The issue with that is, is that if my phone dies, I don't have a wallet. Battery is is a big issue there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then with tap and go, security is a big issue there. So yeah. here you have a, a solution, biometrics in general as a category, that is secure, doesn't have the battery issues. You know, so ultimately it solves two of the core problems around you know the payments ecosystem that we have today. Yeah, you know, I, I would see that. And even, even when you start to think about the smart cards that are on your uh, credit card or your debit card these days, is that, uh, I mean, what if what if there was a you know, a, a uh, biometric uh, component to those credit cards. And we're yep. starting to see this emerge, right? Where, where it's like a fingerprint scan or I, I don't know. Like it, To me, it's like a fingerprint sc scan where it, it requires contact from the fingerprint in order to be able to activate the chip, in order to be able to make the payment or the tap or the pass, right? So I think that there's, you know, we're just at the beginning of this. And, and I said this last week is that, you know, it's good to experiment with this stuff, but the, the likelihood, you know, this is three or four or seven years away before we as consumers are, are comfortable doing this and businesses are equipped to do this. So I think that it, it's good at setting the vision, but there are 38 million steps between now and then in order to be able to get this in every store, right? And, and, uh, and so I, well, I, I applaud the effort here is that I think that we are, we are so many steps away from that kind of payment process where it's where it's accepted in every store. I agreed. But, I agree. Yeah. It's still like that's why like I'm torn. I'm a technologist. 
but I can't love everything. And I seem to, but I, I put a little bit of a realistic spin around it to say, listen, you know what, what's the next thing, right? And it just can't be something that is way out there. It has to be something that the consumers would use and the businesses are willing to adopt. Um, and I think that we're, we're getting, we're getting there slowly, right? And I agree the, the, this smartphone could be a great enabler, but I believe that over the next, you know, three or four years, the battery drain on this is going to increase before battery technology or the cloud or the the operating system up in the cloud emerges. And, uh, you know, so I think that the next three or four years, we're going to get like four, five hours max out of these batteries before they have to be charged, right? And then I start, we're going to start to see them expand and, and we're not going to do better batteries. We're just going to put the operating system in the cloud and do all the processing up there. And then this becomes a conduit, a dumb screen. That's when batteries will last 24 hours uh, without a charge. And I think that at that point, we can start talking about this as the wallet, but not until then. Well, that's it. Six go. and a half stories. Keep co-founder or keep co keep founder Brian Wong, our mobile minute with Chuck Martin and our app of the week, Quad Streaker, all in less than an hour, all with less than stellar bandwidth, but we made it through. I think. I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> Band bandwidth constraint and all. I think, I think we got it. We'll see. I think we got it all. So uh, that's it for the episode. We will be back next week for episode number 140, uh, hopefully with a better connection, uh, similar or even greater stories. If you have one that you'd like us to, uh, to feature, if you'd like one that you'd like to contribute a story to us, please, please, please reach out on Tether at, or, or rob at untether.tv or receive at the lbma.com or on tether.tv forward slash talk. That's the way that you get in touch with us. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. You, we are accessible. Please reach out and let us know if you, uh, you have anything you'd like us to talk about. Anything else to add to that, Asif? I'm good. All right. Well, buddy, enjoy New York City. We will see you next week for episode number 140. Have a good one.